but the burden of proof is on them to convince the scientific community that there is a bear there. Okay? What they have done is gone to the opinion editorial pages and gone to the school boards and fought the fight there. I'm sorry, that's not how you do science. If you want to do science, you convince the scientific community that you have a valid scientific argument. And that, my friends, is what they simply have not done. So when the school board of the small community of Dover, Pennsylvania, after much wrangling, passed a policy requiring the teaching of intelligent design, scientists were appalled. A group of parents sued, and uh, I hope I'm not spoiling the end, the judge ruled against the district and granted the plaintiffs $2 million in court costs, which, by the way, uh, the, um, uh, law, uh, the legal team only requested $1 million um, because the point was not to bankrupt this little district, the point was to send a message, school districts shouldn't do this in the future. <laughs> there was, it was a two-part policy. Uh, the policy required the teaching of intelligent design and also teaching the gaps slash problems of evolution. This sounds very much like the creationist lemonade of Edwards versus Aguilar, the scientific alternatives to evolution and the evidence against evolution of Scalia's dissent which, of course, were creationists wanted to be taught. In 2004, the Dover School Board was considering the adoption of high school biology textbooks. Teachers wanted the standard commercial textbook, Miller and Levine's Biology, and a school board member accused the book of being laced with evolution and wanted to balance it with our friend and his people. The um, legal team for the plaintiffs consisted of a large Pennsylvania uh, law firm called Pepper Hamilton and two public interest uh, groups, Americans United for Separation of Church and State and the ACLU and my organization, the National Center for Science Education. For the uh, uh, pro bono defending the school district was the Thomas More Law Center from Michigan, led by Richard Thompson. Thompson actually didn't spend that much time in court. Uh, his deputies were Patrick Gillen and Robert Mews. Now, the defense ex expert witnesses were Scott Minnick, a biologist from the University of Idaho, um, William Dembski, Michael Behe from Lehigh University, uh, Warren Nord from the University of North Carolina, John Angus Campbell, at that time from the University of Memphis, Stephen Fuller from the University of Warwick, Stephen Meyer from the Discovery Institute, Dick Carpenter from uh, Focus on the Family from your fine state, and the University of Colorado Springs, and their argument, the theory of their case, they needed to show that there was a secular pedagogical value of teaching intelligent design. It was clear that there was a religious reason for teaching intelligent design, that there was an inherent religious component to it, but in order to prevail in court, they had to show that there was a good pedagogical reason for teaching intelligent design. In other words, intelligent design was valid science. And then to deal with the gaps, problems, and evolution component of the policy, that they had to show that evolution was questionable science. On our side, we had Ken Miller um, from um, uh, Brown University, the philosopher of science Robert Pennock from Michigan State, uh, theologian John Haught from Georgetown University, Barbara Forrest, a um, philosopher of science acting as historian from uh, Louisiana State, uh, Ryan Alters from McGill University, acting as a, well, he's a science educator, and Kevin Padian from uh, a paleontologist from UC Berkeley. Our um, the theory of our case was to show that no, <laughs> there is no pedagogical reason for teaching intelligent design. Intelligent design is religion. Um, and we had to show that, in fact, there was no valid secular reason for teaching intelligent design. We had to show that ID was not science. We had to counter their arguments and that intelligent design was factually wrong. And we had to show that, in fact, evolution was solid science, that the gaps, problems, and evolution argument was wrong. We began with Ken Miller. We ended with Kevin Padian. We wanted to begin and end with a science for, scientist for a reason. We wanted to signal to the judge that science was important in this case. It was perfectly possible, you know, conceivable, to, for, for the theory of our case, to argue this solely on the facts of the case, 
the, the school board members had lied in de deposition. You know, we, we could have, you know, we could have just done it on the venality of the school board members. But we wanted to try to try the science of the case, partly because we didn't want to do the same case six months down the line with another school board. We wanted to get the scientific issues out in Dover because the scientific issues we felt were going to be well expressed here. Um, and because this was the chance to do it. Now this was a very, um, um, well, the trial began with witnesses for our side, with Ken Miller, defining what science was, giving reasons why intelligent design was not science. This was a very high-tech trial, by the way. Uh, you can see this screen here in this uh, courtroom sketch. Um, that was just for us, uh, for those of us who were, who were watching the trial and the, um, and the audience. Because if you look here, uh, the judge has his own uh, monitor, and the witnesses had, had their own monitor. The lawyers also had their own monitors, and that was where the business was going on. There were PowerPoints. Um, we, this, this was very high tech, like I said. Um, this, this was a highly um, illustrated trial. We had, to, we had to show a lot of science to the judge as to why the bacteria flagellum arguments were a lot of nonsense. And so we had to put a lot of science out, and graphically, you know, it's, graphics are a good way to get a lot of science across quickly. You all know that because your students or your faculty members. Um, fortunately, those of us in the audience could also see, and the reporters who were cover, covering the trial could also see what was going on. Miller was our first witness, and he attacked Behe's idea of irreducible complexity and his specific examples of the supposed phenomena that evolution couldn't explain, like the bacteria flagellum, the immune system, the blood clotting system, and so forth. And then Kevin Padian got up at the end, and he attacked the pandas and people arguments and showed that when they got to organismic uh, biology, they were a disaster as well. Um, and he also supported the idea that evolution was a very strong science. And he also showed the uh, ties between intelligent design and creation science. Now, we were helped by considerable disarray on the side of the defense. In fact, the case began uh, uh, unraveling fairly quickly with the fact witnesses. And it became clear that school board members had a religious intent in passing the policy. But it also began to unravel on the um, expert witnesses uh, on the science and pedagogy side. The expert witnesses began mysteriously vanishing. Um, uh, Vemsky disappeared, John Angus Campbell disappeared, Steve Meyer disappeared, uh, Nord disappeared, your friend from uh, Colorado Springs disappeared, leaving basically Scott Minnick, Michael Behe, and Steve Schroeder as the only expert witnesses for the defense side. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when uh, the discussions between the Discovery Institute and the Thomas More Law Institute took place and the decision was made to pull all the people associated with the Discovery Institute. But that's what happened. There was a whole lot of science in this uh, trial. This is an illustration from the New Yorker. Uh, for six weeks, the courtroom of Judge Johnny Jones III was like the biology class you wish you could have taken. And it really was. But what was important in the trial was not so much the science, actually, although we loved it, but that we show that intelligent design was a form of creation science. Because creation science, you recall, had already been judged unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1987. Remember? Edwards versus Aguilar. And the history of pandas and people proved very useful in this regard. Now, as part of discovery, we were do this. There we go. In part of discovery, we were able to this is worth it actually, so hang in there. In part of discovery, we were able to get manuscripts of pandas and people uh, in its early days. And we found that the pandas and people manuscripts had very creation sounding titles in its early days. Creation biology was what it was called in 83. Biology and creation was called in 86. Biology and origins in 87. And then 1987, they changed the title to Pandas and People. And they had two versions of Pandas and People in 87, which we cleverly called version one and version two. And then finally in 1989, the first edition of Pandas in 1993, the second edition of Pandas. 
Well, when we got those editions of pandas in the NCSE office, we scanned them and uh, my staff 